Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And uh, I'm Jack Russell, uh, United States Naval Institute Press uh, Sales and Marketing Manager. And we are here again. This time uh, we're in uh, the library here at the Naval Institute uh, looking at some more archival blueprints of uh, some Russian ships. Um, if you've seen the last video about the Gibbs and Cox hybrid design, um, this is sort of a follow-up to that. Um, mentioned in the um, Russian and Soviet battleship book is this ship, or Design D. In the book, what's amazing is that the author, Stephen McLaughlin, who knows his stuff, says that there are no plans or sketches of this ship available, and yet here we are in our archive looking at these plans today, right? And according to our archivists, um, this is probably the only set in existence, right, of Ship D, or what would be the U.S. sort of contemporary design for the Soviet Navy in sort of like the lead up to World War II. So this is 1939. So the hybrid, the gigantic hybrid design is ultimately shut down by the Navy in 1938. And that's labeled as Design A? That, well, see, that has, that's Project 1058.1. Okay. And that actually had three different designs, A, B, and C. Okay. The one we looked at was design A of that particular project. Gotcha. It's, it's kind of confusing. Um, and then, so hypothetically then, yeah, this could be D, but it's a completely different ship. Well, some features are very similar, but. Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea here is, is that the U.S. Navy says, okay, you can't have a 75,000 ton you know, 12 gun mega battleship hybrid carrier floating around. Okay, we're not gonna allow that. But what we will do is help you build a bunch of sort of, you know, treaty era-esque ships. They're not treaty, so they're not 35,000 tons. These are gonna be 45,000. Well, the Soviet Union has not signed any of the Washington right. or London e treaties. Exactly, and that's ultimately the Navy's problem is that it's designing a bunch of treaty battleships, North Carolina's, South Dakota, um, yeah, South Dakota. Um, but the Soviets still then are going to have ships that exceed that. Um, so this is Gibbs and Cox's design um, for that battleship. Um, ultimately, this design would be rejected and designs from Italy and Russia's own internal designers would become Sovetsky Soyuz. Um, so this obviously was not, um, was not taken any further than what you see. And it doesn't seem like many features from this are taken from here. Maybe the concept of a 16 inch gun, the Italian design I think only had a 15 inch gun or it had a notional 16 inch gun, but there was no Italian version of that gun in existence. That is correct, yeah. So the Asado plans that are given to the Russians for like the bigger Latorio mentioned the gun caliber of being, you know, 16 inches, mm -hmm. but you're, you're right. Italy has nothing like that. And so it, th that gun did not come from Italy. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to go over these plans and see how they sort of compare to battleships like uh, maybe uh, North Carolina and then, you know, how they compare to New Jersey. And this is a much more reasonable uh, design. It, it's very similar to contemporary ships. It's uh, in a size that can be built in most of the major shipyards and can be maintained in most of the major dry docks, it appears. Uh, so I'm really excited to see this. Right. So as mentioned, um, these are going to be about 45,000 tons standard displacement mm -hmm. and sort of in the 800 foot range. Okay. Um, not as long as, you know, in Iowa, um, you know, eight, you know, 820 or something sort of in that in that realm. Mm -hmm. um, and then how does the displacement uh, the Iowa class was designed to be 45,000 tons standard and ended up being 57, 58,000 tons fully loaded in wartime. Right. So probably pretty similar to right. these ships. Because the, the book does say that it estimates maybe about a 53,000 ton okay. Yeah, okay. loaded. It doesn't have as much length for growth as the Iowa's did. Right, right. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it then. So uh, first off, I'm real interested in the configuration of the main battery, where you've got uh, two triple turrets up forward, and then a single quadruple turret back aft. This ship, pretty similar to the Iowa class, gets wider towards the back of the ship, and so there's more room back there for a, a wider barbette. Right. 
Also interesting too is going with the quad turret, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you know, when we think of quad gun turrets, you know, we think of uh, like Richelieu and mm -hmm. the French, and we also think of KGV, yeah, right. And having sort of this, you know, we, um, you know, triple turrets in the front, quad in the back, again, reminiscent of kind of KGV, where you have like the two quads and then the double, and mm -hmm. of course those ships were treaty nightmares um and uh, of course also i mean let's think about north carolina a contemporary of this right so i mean let's think about north carolina was supposed to have sort of quad gun turrets and there are designs of that ship with quad guns of course then you know the escalator clause in the treaty and then you know then that ship's redesigned with uh, nine 16 inch guns and likewise some of the montana designs show quad turrets either as the entire battery or in the fantail position because that's the only place that's wide enough for them. And even like going back to like the Tillman designs, oh. right? Like quad four times four, 16, like, or, or uh, 18 inch, like the yeah. fantasy just goes on and on. <laughs> and then of course, what about the, uh, the Iowa's where you have quad the eight inch 55s, right? The, yeah. The Salem, yeah. Some the of the anti-aircraft. The uh, so there's, there's, so the quad turrets, right? But this is a, a generally a turret though that doesn't show up too much in the US Navy. So seeing that configuration certainly is interesting here. Whereas, as you mentioned, you have a more traditional um, three times three layout, um, or no, sorry, the triple turrets for the, for the front guns. Um, you mentioned though the design yeah, the, the drawings of these in particular uh, look much more similar to the shape of the U.S. Navy's late teen and early 20 eras guns, like you see on the Tennessee and Colorado class battleships that are very, very angular. Uh, and by the time you get to the North Carolinas and the Iowas, they, they still have some of these angles on them, but it's much, much less pronounced. So this a lot of features of this look significantly older than the late 30s in which it's being right. designed. One of the things to note is, and you mentioned those older battleships, and we did in the other video as well, is that the U.S. actually agreed to sell those gun turrets to the Soviet Union as a part of this sort of like this agreement that came. One of the things that Sam Karp was able to do was to acquire those particular turrets. So this could be like, hey, design this ship, use the turrets that the U.S. Navy is willing to sell to the Soviet Union instead of like the, the newer design that would ultimately be equipped on North Carolina. Hmm. Right. So th that's a possibility. I don't know that to be true, but, you know, given the circumstances, it might actually be the case. And uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. The North Carolina has range finders in her turrets. These are not depicted having range finders. And it may be the case that the Tennessees and Colorados did not have turret-mounted rangefinders, or they might have. So I, I'm not quite sure. This is, uh, it is weird that this design omits that redundant fire control feature. Right, exactly. Um, is there anything else um, that you want to point out? Um, uh, the secondary battery, I think we talked about, looks sort of standard for a... Uh, well, <laughs> or maybe not. Uh, I said that earlier, but now looking at this outboard side profile. Oh, yeah, you can see the longer lower gun houses for the five inch 38 caliber. Gun. Now, these aren't dual purpose. Exactly. Right. They're like the ones we put on our destroyer leaders right. that uh, save weight by not having the high angle function. Right. So, so it's not an anti aircraft battery. Right. So this is strictly a secondary battery, not dual purpose. You know, like Ryan said, not an anti aircraft battery, which on that Major uh, oversight. Which, on that note, I mean, looking around, there's not too much in the way of, at least in this on this plan, looks like, you know, design any aircraft positions. You know, again, this is also 1939. Yeah, we got four uh, quad 1.1 inch. We got uh, one, probably some more 50 cals around. Uh, standard American battleship practice at this time, 1939, uh, pre-war, would be to have um, eight five inch guns, often 25 caliber, uh, to have four of the medium 1.1s or sometimes single mount threes, right. and to have eight 50 caliber machine guns. Um, so this isn't too much below the anti-aircraft capability of American battleships of the same time period, okay. but those battleships are significantly smaller right. than this one, about 15,000 tons and about 200 feet uh, smaller. 
Another thing to note, so, okay, so in terms of length, that might be the case, but I'm also noticing the, like, sort of the lack of superstructure, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, we can, we're going to mention this later, but single funnel. And this is also a pretty small funnel in terms of it's, it's not that tall. You know, you, something like this, you might expect a funnel here, you know, and maybe here. Yeah, two funnels would make Almost more like sense. Iowa, New Jersey, you know. You've got about 400 feet of length here for engineering spaces. Do, right. do you remember what the shaft horsepower of this guy was supposed to be? Around 200,000, so just slightly less than, you so, know. So that's like a 31-knot design. Right. Yeah, that was, that was one of the things that um, the Soviets did require out of any battleship that they were designing with the U.S. is that it had to exceed 30 knots, right? That's interesting. Why do you think that was? That, that's a weird, like, way higher than what most other countries are designing. Well, I think, you know, uh, it comes back to we're not going to have that many of them, you know? So we've got to transition from So, fleet. you know, in, in, right. So not only do we have a lot of ocean to cover, right? So you need the extra speed. But in any sort of situation, you're also going to need the extra speed to escape the multiple slower ships that are chasing you, right? So think like Scharnhorst and Geneza now. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the idea is that if we can't sink you, I got to run away from you, you know? And this is, you know, like battle cruiser-esque ideas, you know? And again, this is still, um, this is still 1939. The concept of a fast battleship, you know, which this very much is, mm-hmm. um, is still taking shape, you know, and then will um, we'll come to fruition through the war and everything, so. Um, so we've talked about armor, we've talk, or firepower, we've talked about speed. Uh, you just mentioned battle cruiser. Do you know what the armor of this is supposed to be? It's 13 inches. The belt is 13 inches, so not bad. And Which it's is pretty much the same as the standard type right. battleships with 14 and 16 inch guns. And it's sloped at uh, 15 or so degrees. Okay, so that gives it the equivalent thickness of, uh, off the top of my head, that's about 16 or 17 inches of straight armor plate. Right. So, um, wow. So this has one more gun barrel than an Iowa-class battleship mm-hmm. on a similar, slightly smaller size. It has um, just a little bit less speed, but more armor than an Iowa-class battleship. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even though this is a significantly older-looking design, its capabilities are right mm-hmm. in the same ballpark. Right. Another thing to notice, too, is on these quads, mm-hmm. I don't know the case of the KGVs, okay? But I do know on the French quad turrets, there is a separator plate mm-hmm. that runs down in the middle of the turret. Mm-hmm. So you see these two gun barrels are closer together, and there's this space in the center. Yeah, there's a right. big space there. So the gun, the turret is divided in two. So it's like having two twin turrets just welded together right sitting in the same right bar that is and, what it looks like right and uh that was again how it was on the french quad turrets um and so that's interesting and they, the idea is is that you know if a shell penetrates like the left side for instance well it doesn't knock out the entire turret assuming that it doesn't break like you know traverse or you know. Mm-hmm. i think you know how would you describe that thing because i believe that the two gun pairs are locked together but then the two pairs yes there would be two elevation motors one for each pair of turrets one rotation motor for the whole right um what about the boats like this so so the lack of superstructure through the midship section the single funnel which is relatively short the boat this remind this is this this boat layout is this sort of contemporary or with the U.S., or this looks more European, I, I don't know. This reminds me of, like, British and, and German vessels having sort of all the boats clumped together right amidships with the cranes. Yeah, the, the standard type American battleships from the teens and carrying this into Pearl Harbor basically had a significant boat park amidships. Um, and sometimes they'd put the boats in the water, and that's where the football teams would practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- this is... Similar for those, even the Iowa-class battleships were designed to have boats carried amidships and cranes for those, but they were deleted, and that's where the uh, triple 40-millimeter uh, position amidships ended up being. So th- right. this is pretty contemporary, pretty contemporary. Uh, but we find that that burns significantly. Yeah, yeah, you have this gigantic wood pile in the amidships. With you know. gas in them, and, right. and the same with... We're putting the aircraft there instead of on that really broad fantail, which right. 
again, very European to have that amidships. That's actually interesting, too, because, you know, you think of when you see a U.S. ship with an aircraft amidships, right? You think of the older cruisers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but they have hangars. True. Right. I, there's nothing here that looks to me like an aircraft hangar. And especially when you look at it here, it's not like there's a gigantic door or some facility. It looks like these are, the catapults are there and the aircraft sit on it and that's yeah. th that's it. Yeah, that would do tremendous damage if that fueled aircraft was hit. It mm -hmm. takes up a lot of space that could be better used by any aircraft guns. Uh, and you've got that broad fantail that isn't being used. Uh, so it'll be interesting when we look at the inboard profile, uh, mm -hmm. how deep that fantail is. Because the, the U.S. Navy tends to put it on the fantail unless it's really shallow. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, Gibbs and Cox isn't the U.S. Navy. Right. Yeah, that's very true. Exactly. Um, in a hypothetical refit, do you see maybe one catapult being moved to the stern and then that position being used for 40 millimeter mounts later on? Absolutely. Absolutely. I uh, or even I, I could see one being mounted on top of that huge turret uh, back there as well. Oh, no, absolutely. absolutely. Similar to, you know, like the South Dakotas and all, well, all the other battleships, really. Um, but our, our standard types tend to lose that during the war and just keep their fantail on. So I could easily see a crane and the fantail catapults, which we saw on that design A in the previous video, which we've linked in the description down below. Uh, so I wouldn't even be surprised if they changed that while under construction. Right. What about the the, the five inch secondary battery? Um, the only reason to use this instead of the dual purpose version is weight saving. Right. If you're not worried about weight, upgrade that. Right. Yeah. Get the high angle ones in there. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on then to the inboard profile. That's a reasonably deep uh, stern back there. I don't see any reason why it couldn't support a catapult in an aircraft. We're talking about uh, probably somewhere between 100 and 150 tons. Oh, oh boy. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you think? Uh, so initial reaction, it looks like uh, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mm -hmm. boilers on each side so that's 16 boilers which is the same as the lexington class battle cruisers slash aircraft carriers right um i don't see where the engine rooms are unless they're combined fire and engine rooms engineering main spaces which is common with ships like north carolina and the south dakota class mm -hmm. um, we've got diesel generators at each end of the engineering main spaces just like american fast battleships um what about the um the trunking here i mean that's just i mean it's instead of coming up here at an angle for funnel one and then here funnel two and like you said you know the iowas have the special trunking so that you know you can't take a bomb directly down this just this seems yeah very so odd. The, these go up pretty straight and then have these long runs to get to that funnel. So it's taking up a ton of your internal volume. You don't have much additional internal volume because there's hardly any superstructure up above. Right. Uh, and if a bomb hits, it goes right down that trunk, which is what the U.S. Navy thought happened to Arizona in the immediate aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, which is why you see the Iowa-class battleships get these weird S-curves in their uptakes uh, to prevent a single bomb from going down those funnels. And that's why our uptakes are armored. One, not just one more thing about this funnel. This looks like the funnel of another Gibbs and Cox design. And I believe it's floating down wind of your battleship. Yeah, kind of low, kind of uh, broad with a, a low yeah. uh, funnel cap on top. Right. That would be the uh, ocean liner, yeah, SS, <laughs> SS United, United States. States. Uh, yeah. And... Um, mm -hmm. SS America, which is right. built around the same time, has a has a very similar right. funnel. Yeah, they look similar, but obviously the America was a lot smaller. And she serves during World War II as the USS West Point, a troop ship. Mm -hmm. uh, but those ships have nothing above the funnels. This, your funnel is exhausting directly into your aft fire control position. And that's interesting because this aft fire control position, especially as we see it in the in the other design was similar to what we saw on the hybrid battleship in that it was this cage mast, you know, but with this, you know, weird sort of um, girder structure. Yeah. Um, 
it's drawn very similar. You know, if um, if this gets refit, you know, you probably see this getting cut down, and uh, you know, a, a, maybe a Iowa or South Dakota esque, you know, rangefinder put in. Yeah. So the reason why American Standard type battleships have the two superstructures, uh, one, it's redundancy, but two, the forward one looks at the target, the aft one looks at the horizon to make sure that the ship's own role isn't going to throw off your aim. When the United States Navy develops the stable vertical, the, the trigger console that we use with a gyroscope in it that can measure that, they immediately delete the aft towers from all of the standard type battleships. This is like 1941, 1942, as they're being retrofitted with the stable vertical. Uh, so if this ship is being given to the Russians, we don't give them that technology. You need the two. Right. Uh, if we're building this ourselves, mm -hmm. then yeah, we give them this superstructure, right. put in something reminiscent of North Carolina, South Dakota, or Iowa. Our fast battleships look pretty similar yeah. and put in the modern fire control suite. That, that, you know, that, That's a good point, right? So at this point in 1939, the Navy has already gotten um, the Roosevelt administration to cancel the, the hybrid battleship plan. It's too, it's too big, too strong. Um, so that's an interesting thing too. It's, you know, um, design this ship with some of the older tech yeah. right so maybe you know the ship is still big it's still quick it's still got six you know 10 16 inch guns but fire control is not as good no. right you know this trunking you know <laughs> right it's like hmm you know drop a bomb amidships you know like so and there's a lot of amidships to drop right. a bomb on so we know that even though gibbs and cox is a private designer right so they're not navy you know the russians approach them because they could ask for designs right without going through the navy's bureaucracy right but you know but they're also an american company right and despite being international and designing for everybody mm -hmm. right you still have to the navy is still and uh, american ship industry is still a large cu customer and so at the end of the day you kind of have to do what's right for for uh, uncle sam so to speak so um, that's an interesting idea that, you know, perhaps that, you know, these are. Yeah, that, that these are technologically unsophisticated right. because they're meant for foreign sale. Right. Let's see. What about this rudder? She's got multiple rudders. Right. Do you know if that was part of the design requirement? Because that looks just like. Latoria's arrangement. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, from my understanding, I, I don't see anything about the the rudders, the multiple rudder setup, uh, you know, design in in the the text. Um, Do, can you tell if there's an armored box built over those steering gear compartments, or if they're relatively unarmored aft of the aft armored bulkhead? Well, I see the bulkhead here. Uh huh. This, the line that's, there does look like there is a shaded section here and a roof over this steering engine, this room labeled okay. steering engine. So it's perhaps that the space probably is armored in some way. So you're armoring all of that extended stuff. Right. And this, especially the, the last rudder, I mean, you have what I'm assuming is going to be multiple, probably two, you know, one on starboard, one yeah. port, and then even a third. But this is very close to the stern. Yeah, so which is common for the American standard type battleships that right at the back of that right. canoe style stern. Right. Exactly. Um, so it's probably while it may be armored, it might it's most likely not um, as thick as the, sort of the armored sort of, you know, box on on an Iowa. Right. And it looks like outboard shafts are on skegs, inboard shafts are on actual shafts that go through the hull. Uh, and do you trace those shafts out coming all the way forward here? Is that what the, these lines are supposed to? Right, that's what, it, that's what it looks like. So it does seem like the engine rooms are inboard of the fire rooms um, down the length of these engineering main spaces, which again is how the Lexington class aircraft carriers slash battle cruisers were with their 16 boiler compartments on the outside and their engine rooms on the inside. Do we know if these are steam turbine or uh, turbo electric, like the Lexingtons? Uh, these are steam turbine. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, the, uh, Gibbs and Cox was, was fairly consistent 
with the engine selection. And then, of course, that's going to then continue on, you know, speaking of SS United States, right, yeah. it, that continues even to, to them. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have the top profiles of all of the individual decks, so we can't really see what the torpedo defense is. Right. But the fact that your fire rooms are outboard of your engine rooms, if we're reading this uh, incomplete outboard or inboard profile, uh, incomplete in that we can't see the center of the ship, we only see um, the sides there, um, that gives better torpedo defense than uh, not having that. Mm -hmm. Because if a fire room is damaged, oh no, we've only got 15 more boilers to run off of. Right. Exactly. Um, and of course, at the time, um, the Italians were using a, a torpedo protection system, which, you know, on like the, the Latorios, which they thought were good. And then the Russians adopted that to an extent. But then, you know, we only find out later that they were flawed in, in many ways, you know, whereas at least U.S. battleships seem to, you know, seem to hold up. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, the biggest def determining factor in how effective your torpedo defense is, is how deep it is. Even if you've got the right. least sophisticated system, if it's 40 feet deep, you can absorb that impact and, right. and uh, not flood too much. And the, the outboard fire rooms give you that depth. Right. Oh, and one other thing to point out before we go that far is it shows you the max elevation of the guns. It does look like these elevate to 45 degrees, mm -hmm. which is more than the 30 degrees that I believe the Colorados and the Tennessees can get to. Um, but it is what battleships like North Carolina, South Dakota, and Iowa are able to do. Right. So, yeah, perhaps that is just, you know, a placeholder design on the blueprints or something. It might be that they don't know what well, the turrets right, for North right. Carolina look because like. I mean, the back of the turret's relatively flat, you know, versus sloping in like the other. So, no, you're, no, you're right. Um, just a placeholder for, we will take the most modern turret right. we can get and drop it in here. Exactly. I wonder how much of this is placeholders. This is a rangefinder, or this is a five-inch gun right. um, that we have seen in use recently with the U.S. Navy, but we're not quite sure what model will eventually be dropped in here. Exactly. exactly. All right, so um, it is incredibly special that we have found these in your archives here today. Can you tell us a little bit about the resources that you have um, for researchers and authors and where these came from? Um, okay, so Ryan, um, these blueprints were donated to the U.S. Naval Institute. Um, we have, as we said, we're sitting in our library right now. Um, we have um, an archive department, um, which we're also, which is this space as well. Um, and these, like many of our other artifacts, are donated from, you know, private individuals. Um, this comes from an individual um, who you're actually familiar with, uh, Wayne Smith. Um, and uh, he donated these last year along with the hybrid battleship plans. Um, and uh, as he's donated some items to you well, as well. We are currently working with Wayne Smith to acquire his uh, model collection. He designs uh, the one 1200 scale models that Al Navco produces for wargaming and, and uh, scale modeling. So we are looking to acquire his collection so we can use it in future exhibits. Uh, so it was really cool to us who have been working with him to hear that you guys have also been working right. with him. Oh, and likewise, too. Um, so these resources... Um, are available for people to to see obviously you know we have to you can come in and make appointments and such like that we do have a digitized photo archive which can be accessed online um, if you're a member of the Naval Institute approximately around 200,000 digitized photos in the collection that you can access through membership um, with then a total of about um, 500,000 total um, that are available. Um, so for instance, like we've pulled New Jersey's folders for you all today as well. Um, so you can check those out. Um, and so, yeah, so this is just, you know, one of the many things that, you know, ultimately can be viewed. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just amazing that this is what we believe the only sketches and plans, you know, plans for you know, what it's worth of this ship design in the world. 
it's an amazing piece of history and it's a great primary resource to have. Um, of course, right now, uh, as we said in the other video too, we are having a holiday sale, uh, which is um, you get 50% off uh, your purchases through the website. Um, and again, you know, if you're, you're a member, you can, you can, that applies to membership and, and other items. Um, and then you can especially books and everything. And then you can check out the archives for yourselves with your membership. So make sure to check that out. And we got a link to that in the description below. We've got a link to the Design A video we did in the description below. Be sure to watch that one in addition to this one. Uh, and tell us in the comments section down below which one you like better. Also, be sure to check out the link to their uh, various products that are available and the sale that's going on since we've got the holidays approaching. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support from Naval Institute Press in uh, making these videos and supporting our museum. And you can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about our museum and the channel. Thanks for watching.